Again, this is Bori Yang uh, for the record, and I am the Executive Director and Legal Counsel for the Vermont Human Rights Commission, and I know that um, all the committee members are aware that the Human Rights Commission is a state agency that investigates claims of discrimination in housing, in uh, state government employment, and in places of public accommodations, which would include roads and law enforcement agencies as well. Um, part of our mission and statutory mandate is to also provide education and training and advance policies and legislation relating to the protection of Vermont's most vulnerable, uh, which is why I'm here today. The commission supports uh, H518, um, and I have provided a, my written testimony to the committee. Uh, I just want to go briefly through um, the language that we do support again allowing local entities to determine their level of cooperation with the federal immigration authorities, honors the knowledge and insight and experience possessed by these agencies um, regarding their own members um, in their agencies and their communities. Um, and we know from 30 years of implicit bias studies and that um, people have implicit biases about immigrants and what they look like the same way that people have advised about what a U.S. citizen or an American looks like. And so uh, the commission certainly supports language that would prohibit agencies and constables from adopting policies that would allow for greater communication or involvement with federal immigration authorities than are permitted under the model policy. Um, and lastly, the reason why I'm here is I have proposed an amendment um, to 518. Um, part of the biggest criticisms that I've heard from various community members is that the current fair and impartial policy is uh, ineffective because there really is no teeth, uh, for lack of a better word, no meaningful consequence when an agency, when an agency fails to effectively adopt the model policy. Um, the Human Rights Commission um, was recently um, had the statute, has statutory mandate under Act 183 to do inspections of businesses um, in regards to sexual harassment. And so the amendment that I'm proposing here comes from language that uh, gave the Human Rights Commission uh, similar uh, uh, rights to inspect. And so I just want to review that. So for the purposes of assessing compliance, with the provisions of this section, the Human Rights Commission or designee may, with 48 hours notice at reasonable times and without unduly disrupting business operations, enter and inspect the records of any state, county, and municipal law enforcement agency, or question any person who is authorized by the agency or constable to comply with the requirements, requirements of this section, and examine the agency's records, policies, procedures, and training materials related to the fair and impartial policing policy. An agency or constable may agree to waive or shorten the 48-hour notice period. Following an inspection and examination pursuant to this section, the Human Rights Commission shall notify the state, county, and municipal law enforcement agency or constable of the results of the inspection and examination, including any issues or deficiencies provide resources and identify any technical assistance that the Attorney General of the Human Rights Commission may be able to provide to assist the state, county, and municipal law enforcement agency or constable address any identified issues or deficiencies. Let me just say for the record as well that although Act 183 gave the Human Rights Commission this uh, ability to inspect businesses, um, if we suspected that there would be any, um, in fact, actually the statutory language doesn't require that we actually suspect that anybody has violated a sexual harassment policy, but it is a way for us to be notified of um, sexual harassment issues. It's also a way for us to ensure that uh, people are adopting effective sexual harassment policies. And even though that has passed, the Human Rights Commission hasn't done those inspections. And the reason we really haven't done those inspections is lack of resources and lack of time. Our goal and our hope is that we would only use that statutory right when there's indication that a business or um, and a 
um, an agency is, uh, does not have effective policies, or we know through investigations or lawsuits that uh, uh, they don't have effective sexual harassment policies. So through, because of lack of resources, this isn't something that we would engage in on a routine basis. My feeling about adding this language to 518 is that we would be using it in the same manner. That because we already have a statutory mandate to do an agency-initiated complaint, that should there be indications from the community, from community members, that a law enforcement agency has not adopted the fair and impartial police policy or that there are concerns that law enforcement agencies are not following the uh, FIP policy, that that would really be the basis for why the Human Rights Commission would be conducting such an inspection. And um, the goal here is to review those policies and to review um, uh, some of those concerns. A couple of questions sure. than the uh, committee does. But in your package, we have a letter from the ACLU expressing support for this amendment. <clears throat> Did you, was this amendment discussed in the House? Uh, so this, um, I testified in the House um, uh, over the phone. And, um, and I did suggest to them that we would be open to um, doing inspections, and I said that it would be language that would be similar. But I did not have a chance to provide what that language would look like. So that was oral testimony in the House. But yes. There was some confusion that I spoke with Representative Brad, and I was a confused thing. Um, I'm also a little bit confused about the current authority to investigate, if, for example, the Bennington Police Department, it's no secret, has come under fire on several occasions uh, recently. They are doing their own review, but is there anything that would prevent the Human Rights Commission from looking at the Bennington Police Department just based upon current statute? So currently, in order for the Human Rights Commission to do an investigation, we typically wait on someone to file a complaint at the Human Rights Commission. Or we could initiate our own investigation by initiating our own complaint. But a complaint can't just be uh, based on mere suspicion that discrimination has occurred. We usually need to um, have sufficient language that supports what we call a prima facie case of discrimination. And that's really difficult to do. So uh, because we don't have that information without having done the investigation. So oftentimes, we don't do an agency-initiated complaint because we don't lack the information to even start the investigation. Um, and then um, in terms of Bennington, all I can say is that I can't speak as to whether or not the Human Rights Commission do is doing any investigation. No, that, yeah. That's not what I asked. I actually asked is, under current statute, could you, and would this, and the second part of the question was going to be, sure. if this were in effect, would you then be more clearly able to do that? Yes. Or would you be yes. more likely to do that? Yes. So we would more clearly be able to do that and more likely able to do that. So what this inspection would allow us to do is gather sufficient information to see if it would even support a complaint to open an investigation. We do not just start an investigation without there being a complaint that contains language that suggests there could be discrimination. So, for example, uh, just because we hear about something happening in the news doesn't mean that the Human Rights Commission would then um, use its statutory authority to investigate because we don't have sufficient information. The ability to do an inspection would give us the information that we need to start such a complaint and start an investigation. But this would be purely based on the model policy in many Right, yeah. Senator White. So I'm, I am a little confused about this because the model policies are public information. You don't need to go to the to go to the law enforcement agency to inspect their policy. They're all public documents. 
And so you could you could get a public document at any time. Or so why why do and then <clears throat> so it looks like what you're looking at is whether the policies are are um, deficient in some way. But you can look at those policies at any time. Sure. So it, it does say here, um, the language is inspect and examine the agency's records, policies, procedures, and training materials. And I'm not sure how much of records, policies, or procedures, or training materials, which are public, which are not, and... Um, so can, uh, their, their um, policies are public, and their, their training material is usually done through the um, academy, not, I mean, there is some individual training that's done at agencies, but I'm curious about what records you would be looking at. Is like, is it the, um, the, rec the <coughs> records where somebody stops somebody and then they file either, um, they are two record keeping systems in the state and they file a record I mean, they file the, the charge or the stop, or is that what you're looking at? Because I believe those are also public. Sure, I, I think it depends on what would be the basis to do the inspection in the first place. So for example, if we're hearing from community members that this particular police enforcement agency is violating the, the FIP, the policy, or that they haven't enacted it, or even though they've enacted it, they really haven't followed it, that um, depending on those circumstances, if we were dealing with someone who um, is from an immigrant community or someone who's African American, that those might be, we might be asking questions about data or records related to stops regarding immigrants or relating to stops regarding African Americans. Um, and again, I think it's, it's, it's based on the, the, the facts. Um, and what would be our reason for doing the inspection in the first place? And so, um, so uh, this continues on the same line of questioning. So when you, you know, when I was on the agriculture committee, we discussed having an inspection policy for farms yeah. to see whether they were following phosphorus requirements. Yeah. Um, and the idea was you were you were trying to catch uh, bad actors or people who maybe didn't understand what their responsibilities were. So you were you were needing to go there and inspect. Um, so in this case, when you go into a law enforcement agency and you, um, I'm just wondering if you can walk us through how would that work? So you. You notify the law enforcement agency under this language that you want to inspect. They have 48 hours, but they can make it short. Then when you show up, how would you um, inspect? Sure. So yeah. how I foresee this is, again, um, let's say that there's been a lot of news coverage and lots of phone calls at the Human Rights Commission that says this particular police agency is not following the FIP or they seem to be targeting a certain group of people and we have concerns about them, that first I would start with a letter to the agency and saying that under this language we are asking to look at maybe recent stops involving people who are African American or immigrant, whether or not any of those people have been referred to federal um, um, immigration um, authorities, um, and we look asked to look at their policies um, and um, ask them to identify where those policies are posted, and probably ask them to see how many complaints have been made about um, police activity involving um, African Americans or people in the immigrant population. And so it would start off with being a letter and say, is there an opportunity to sit down and talk about it? We'd like to look at these things. Can you provide them? And when can we come and look at them? And it may be that we come and look at them or we see those documents and um, none of it is concerning. And then we would say thank you and we would not open the investigation. But the possibility exists that uh, when community members complain 
that police agencies are not following the FIB, that we could end up seeing data or seeing information that aligns with some of those complaints. And those two things together could, could conceivably uh, be a basis for starting a complaint just to start an investigation. We have not determined at that point that discrimination has occurred or has not occurred. That is just enough to open an investigation to then use our statutory mandate under our existing statute to do a full investigation to see if discrimination is happening. Okay, and um, so to take it one step further, so non-concerning information going further, concerning information, <coughs> you, would, you would go based on that, but what if, what I think is more likely that you would have agencies that say, we don't, we don't have any of this information. Uh, we don't have in this category anything that you have said you're looking for. Would you or could you, under this language, make the decision to go in on the possibility that they may not be offering all the information? Is, is that a part of this possibly too, that you could go in and say, our inspection involves going into the computer system to look at what you have or don't have. So here's my here's my thought: is if we ask for if we have statutory uh, language that allows the Human Rights Commission to do these inspections, I do trust that the law enforcement agencies would comply with the inspection. But if it turns out that they are not collecting that data, they don't have that information or those records. I wouldn't start a complaint just to further investigate. But what that does do is it informs me, as the executive director of the Human Rights Commission, that we're not collecting the information that we need, and that these inspections have revealed that. And I would probably be back here next year saying, perhaps we need to be asking for more data collection or more information to inform us about what is happening in the communities and the relationship between community members and law enforcement agencies. So can you ask for that now? In other words, I, you can send them a letter now asking for these things. If, there's no requirement that they comply with that at this point. Because, right, so the only, the, the only way that uh, the Human Rights Commission can seek this information now under our existing statute is to start the complaint first and then to do the investigation. But what I'm saying is we don't have enough information to initiate our own agency complaint at this point. We are waiting on people to file a complaint at the HRC. But I, I, and I take that point, and I think it's a good one. I, I would be more comfortable with a piece of statute or amendment that said these pieces of data must be provided. What, what you described was more like the ability to go in and search, and it's open-ended. You could search records, is the word you. Yeah. To my mind, that means anything within a law enforcement agency, from the computers to the paper files to the audio files, that's about as open-ended as, as an investigative power goes. Sure. I, 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 and I understand that, and I would say that Last year, when Act 183 passed, the legislature believed that sexual harassment was such an important issue that it was important to give the Human Rights um, Commission that kind of statutory authority to do that level of inspection. And I would say that fair and impartial policing is of the same level, if not more important. Senator Betty, so let me begin by just reiterating that I passed chair of the Human Rights Commission, and I spent almost 36 years now at the end of this month as a criminal defense attorney. I am not oriented towards police conduct. I actually oppose it on a regular basis. In reading your language and hearing your testimony, I hear a big difference. Your testimony is such that you're looking for a pattern of conduct. This language is very specific and grants you an absolute right to go into a police department upon any reason whatsoever without a complainant and investigate files. Now, when I 
get the police affidavit, I know it is also accompanied by a narrative. There's an investigation that has happened. There may or may not yet be a judge that has found probable cause in a criminal case, which means that there's an ongoing investigation. That's not technically public information at that point in time. And I'm reading this that actually gives you the right to go in and seek any agency's records just for the purpose of assessing compliance, which would technically interfere with the police investigation. Not necessarily their business operations, as you accepted here, but with the actual investigation itself. Um, there's no court order that would be needed. You are not in need of any kind of a complaining witness that would generate the reason for investigating this particular uh, agency. And I have to frankly say, I'm uncomfortable, even as a criminal defense attorney, thinking that you would have that power by state authority. Um, and I'm a little nervous, frankly, about what you're asking for. I just I don't really have a response to that. I'm having a hard time knowing the overall intent is to have a pattern of conduct established that leads you to the conclusion that there is, in fact, a violation of that. That's not what this is saying. This is something a heck of a lot different in my eyes. Do you have a different opinion on that? Uh, well, first, I would just like to say that I absolutely respect what you have to say, and I also understand that um, that there, I, I hear your concerns. Um, and I'm really here representing the other concerns, which is uh, people that in the community who are feeling as if the current policy is ineffective or insufficient to address what we're seeing happening across the state. But um, I don't, I, I hear you, and I respect that, and I, I don't, it's possible that we could, uh, amend this language or change it to address some of those concerns, I can't say that I'm prepared at this moment to to, to do that. Just, just so you know, the concept you're presenting, I certainly can understand yeah. and agree with. I'm very nervous about how it's been presented to us. Yeah, and, and again, in, in my mind, all this is is gathering sufficient information to see if we can support a complaint in the first place to then do the investigation. This oh, isn't to, it. right, yes. Could, could I follow up on that? Yep. So, yeah, if, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm just, I'm chewing. You can come back after okay. you chew. So, I, I'm even more confused now. So, if there's a complaint, you could do this right now. Right? Yes. Okay. But it's what you said is that there are complaints coming from communities. And so then you would want to go look at that, that agency. But if there's a complaint, you already have the ability to do it. You don't need to have this open. And, and I, I do have some concerns about the, um, looking at a, any of the records because that's that could as joe said impact an ongoing investigation and i'm just wondering if what you're looking at here is the deficiencies in the policy and whether they're actually carrying out the policy or looking at the actions of individual officers and um, investigating individual officers because if that's the case, that there's already a process for doing that. And this is um, one of the reasons that they can be um, decertified. Sure. Well, let me first suggest, uh, 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 explain the first part of that, which is yeah. of the complaint process. Yeah. So when I say someone files a complaint, that is an individual calls our office and says, I have been discriminated against by so-and-so, this right. law enforcement, or I was stopped unlawfully, or I've been targeted unlawfully. That's an individual. What we, that sometimes happens. But what we do sometimes also hear during our outreach, our training, 
um, is that you have a group of people who say there's a problem with this law enforcement entity, but they are unwilling to come forward, they are afraid of retaliation, or it is their friends or their family members. So they are th themselves not the people filing the complaint. But we'll hear that from several different community members. And that's an example in which, oh, okay, maybe this is something that the Human Rights Commission is uh, could look into. So, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the res public response to what was happening in Bennington was, why isn't the Human Rights Commission looking into this? Isn't that why we have a Human Rights Commission? Well, we can't look into it because we don't have enough information to even start the investigation. And unless somebody files a complaint the Human Rights Commission, that can't happen. It can't be a complaint from the community. It has to be an individual that's Yes. Agree. Yes. Or we initiate our own agency complaint, and we would have done that if we had sufficient information. But we can't do the investigation until we have the information to support the complaint. It's 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 uh, it, again. If there was another agency that is better equipped, or that we are supporting to do that work. I mean, the Human Rights Commission is, is happy to do that, but I would just refer you to all the public statements that have been made that it is the job of the Human Rights Commission to handle what was happening in Bennington. Well, uh, and it's not just Bennington folks. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> that just happens to be the example that I was brought up. I brought that up, yes, but also exactly. uh, there was a Supreme Court case that highlighted an issue with Bennington, so I, yeah. <clears throat> that was a different way to get at it. But uh, my, I'm going to put my appropriations committee hat on. You said you have a problem with resources now to do the jobs that you've got. Um, you do. And we have $253 million in requests over the governor's budget level. Um, and we have also unfunded promise about water quality and an unfunded promise about weatherization we have an unfunded well and the finance committee wants to do about four billion dollars in tax breaks to reduce revenue so in all of that how do is this any more than just a window dressing that said you can but we don't we don't provide you with the resources to actually do it yeah i mean I think that's a very fair um, statement to make. And um, I have been very honest in that we haven't done any inspections related to Act 183 because of lack of resources. So I don't see this as this ability to go into any law enforcement agency and just ask for a bunch of records because I don't have the time to do that. I actually am dealing with people who have filed complaints and those investigations and and more. Um, so my thought is that should another situation arise like we saw in Bennington, that that would probably be a situation in which we could utilize this language to say, what is happening down there? Please give us some information in regards <laughs> to the FIP. Right, did you adopt it? What has that looked like? You know, what are the records like in terms of police stops? And does this support an agency-initiated complaint to start an investigation? But um, yeah, I mean, again, I'm but being very honest that this isn't something that we're going to be doing just because we have the right to do it now. And in defense of Bennington, I must say that uh, the University of Vermont did a study on traffic data and concluded that it was biased based upon the data that the Center for Justice Research yes. at Norwich yes. did their own study and said the University of Vermont study was flawed and it's inaccurate. And then the UVM people said, with all due respect to UVM, they said, no, the Center for Justice Research is flawed. Nobody actually, so in all of that, yes, I know. the people of Bennington are somewhat confused, but uh, I will say this for publicly, that they are doing a review um, of their police policies uh, initiated by the community and town um, select board. So that is ongoing, but I will say that sometimes the information that people get 
is not as accurate as one would think. And I know UVM is still defending their study, but I have gone over both studies and have read the Center for Justice Research, if I've got the right name. Crime um, Research Group. Crime Research Group. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, the crime that was the Center for Justice Research, now it's the Crime Research Group. Anyway, their study indicated that the that their, their methods were flawed, would like to do a study. There is one other group that I am concerned with that nobody has talked about, and that's young people being profiled, whether they're people of color, whether they're um, whatever, but particularly uh, those under 22, let's say, who are being profiled, and that's one of the concerns that has been expressed. Um, and is that a group that also could be looked at? Uh, I mean, potentially. In bias free police? Sure, potentially. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, I, I <coughs> jogged the question when you were talking about the Bennington situation. So I, I remember what you're talking about, people saying the Human Rights Commission right. should jump in. Did you contact the Bennington Police Department about FIP and their. Um, no, I did not. And my question would be why? Because you don't need this legislation to send them a letter asking for their policy and how they operate. Right, but they're not going to comply. I'm an, I work for an enforcement agency, and I don't have an authority outside an investigation to seek that kind of information. And so it's a wishful, yeah, it would be, I could have written a wishful letter and say, please give me some information so I can look into it. But that's, that. I don't think practically that that would But you have a stronger position today if you had, because you could say they denied me this information, this information, and this information. And then we could look at specifically requiring agencies to provide those categories. Um, instead, we're expressing uh, concern with this language because it's a very broad brush. Um, so, there is another way to narrow down what you're trying to accomplish. Defense attorneys regularly bring suppression motions based on documents that present situations of clear profile. Uh, those documents that they're using are literally the affidavits of the mayor and the police officers. There's a defense bar that a simple conversation with them to determine whether there's a established pattern that they're noticing might help. But then you have the potential of developing a specific complaint and then having the ability to use what you currently have for legislation. I keep coming back and looking at this language. I'm thinking, if we gave this right to any other agency, name the police or law enforcement type of agency that is given carte blanche opportunity to go in and investigate records anywhere they want to. Chloe over there would be screaming bloody murder in a heartbeat. I don't even know where she is for this particular issue, but I'm just trying to think of a way to get to where you want to be. Sure. If, Conceptually, she supports. And, but, and in fact, we did. Yeah. Uh, one, whether it was this bill or another bill, we actually removed that ability from yeah. the AG's office um, to, to do that. Or we didn't give it to Let me just say, let me just say for the record that, so I, I heard it from many community members um, about uh, what was happening in Bennington, but what was happening with law enforcement agencies throughout the state of Vermont. And they, uh, and I've heard public a lot of public officials and otherwise say, why isn't the Human Rights Commission doing something? And this is my best response. And I, I, I felt that I owed them that to present it. I, but I appreciate yes. your uh, response. I think it's a sense of the committee that it should be narrowed to some extent. Sure. That it's very broad, and then the other sense of the committee is that uh, we should pick on Virgins next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and should this committee not 
adopt this amendment this legislative session it's language that is something to consider the next legislative session. I, I would also say that this is a resource issue as well. Yes. We have expectations that a commission can do things and the public has expectations that it can do things that it's not resourced to do. It becomes our responsibility to meet those expectations and in this environment that's very difficult. I know that your commission does a terrific job and I, and I appreciate all the hard work you do. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you very much. Thank you. Thank you for it. Uh, our next witness is Enrique. Uh, is somebody coming with you today? Do you want to pull the chair up your wallet too? Or? Whatever's easy. Estoy aquí eh, apoyando el Bill 518 eh, y también la enmienda presentada por eh, la Comisión de Derechos Humanos. Y también, bueno, hemos visto el testimonio de Mark y que nos eh, que recomienda algunos cambios adicionales en la política y también nos parecen bien, eh, pero vamos a enfocar hoy en la recomendación de la, de la Comisión de Derechos Humanos. So I'm here supporting Bill 518 in the amendment presented by the HRC. We also have seen the testimony of Mark Hughes, maybe you got it. Um, he recommends some changes, additional changes, and we believe these are good, but now we're gonna focus more on our testimony about the amendment with the HRC. Bueno, eh... Como la comunidad migrante en Vermont eh, y, to y en todo el país, ¿verdad? la comunidad migrante, siempre hemos sufrido eh, la presión política de inmigración. ¿verdad? Eh, hemos estado trabajando, por, aquí en Vermont, hemos estado trabajando por muchos años en, en la política no más polimigra para realmente parar la colaboración entre los policías e inmigración. Eh, pero esta ha sido debilitada bajo el gobierno de, de Donald Trump Y, y la policía por querer seguir manteniendo la, la comunicación con las agencias de, 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 de inmigración. So here the migrant community in Vermont and the whole country we've been suffering about the political pressure of immigration policies and we've been working really hard for years in this FIP policy uh, but this has been uh, witnessed uh, is weak now under the new administration of Donald Trump. And you know, we see that the, the police is defending and wants to maintain this relationship with the immigration agencies. And at the end, um, it's not something that strengthens the trust in the police and the communities, uh, the migrant communities. Y bueno, algo que quería igual uh, decir es que bueno, nosotros Eh, yo he sido trabajador lechero aquí y en Vermont tenemos una comunidad eh, lechera, ¿verdad? Este, de trabajadores migrantes que ayudan, que ayudamos a sostener esta industria y que hemos estado trabajando fuertemente eh, para mejorar esta política y, y ya no ser discriminados y separados de nuestras familias o de nuestros trabajos. So I want to acknowledge that I'm a migrant worker. I've been working on dairy farms, and I'm, we're a whole community here that are sustaining the dairy industry. 
we're really important for the state. And we have been working for years here and we want to recognize, be recognized. Eh, y bueno, eh, enfocando un poco más, eh, como dije la semana pasada, es sumamente necesario que, eh, que esto se mejore, ¿verdad? Porque no es suficiente. Eh, mencionamos la política modelo eh, y, por ejemplo, el 25% de las agencias eh, no tienen la política modelo o adecuada, la mínima, ¿verdad? Eh, también eh, algunas políticas han resultado en que no se han actualizado desde el 2011, 2014, 2016 y políticas que ni mencionan eh, nada acerca de inmigración. So I want to rectify the importance of this because we see that the actual structures haven't been enough or sufficient. Uh, we talked last week about 25% of the agencies don't have the right policy. Uh, policies that haven't been updated since 2011, 2014, 2016. Also, the policies don't even mention the non-collaboration with immigration enforcement. The, uh, Director Garfield will testify in a few minutes if that actually was an accurate, that, that they're all up to date right now. Entonces también eh, mencionamos acerca de la falta de transparencia hacer, eh, con el entrenamiento a los policías acerca de, de, de este tema. <coughs> Eh, y bueno, las violaciones siguen eh, en varios testimonios, mis compañeros y yo. Eh, Hemos estado aquí, hemos mencionado por ejemplo el caso de Olman López en Vergenz, el caso de José Luis y Armando en Franklin y bueno también la semana pasada les compartí que, que yo viví esto en carne propia, ¿verdad? Cuando el DMV proporcionó en mi caso y en otros casos información a la agencia de ICE eh, cuando también está cubierta eh, bajo la política del FIP. And we also brought that the violations continue. I talked last week about the case of Oman Lopez in Virginia, Jose Luis and Armando in Franklin County, and even about my own uh, experience of discrimination with the DMV collaborating with ICE uh, when the DMV should be covered by the FIP. Todo esto resulta en una falta de confianza en que realmente todo se está cumpliendo, ¿verdad? Y por ende, la comunidad migrante en Vermont no se siente cómoda en usar eh, las agencias de policía. Eh, en, en ningún caso, ¿verdad? En, en casi ningún caso, por ejemplo, violencia doméstica, no, a veces no se usa este recurso, la violencia física en el lugar de trabajo y entre otros. Incluso algunos empleadores eh, han resultado que amenazan a los trabajadores con llamar a la policía para el desalojo de las viviendas cuando han trabajado ahí por años o con la intención de deportarlos. En todos estos casos, uh, resulta en la falta de confianza a la policía porque no están cumpliendo. Y en la comunidad, la migrante comunidad en Vermont, no se siente confortable con usar los recursos. Uh, from the agencies. We see cases about like domestic violence, violence in the workplace, um, even some employers using their power of threatening workers to call the police to keep them out of the farm or with the intention to um, they are going to be deported. Y basado en esta historia, es claro que un nivel adicional de transparencia y rendición de cuentas a, a, apoyará a las agencias a cumplir ¿verdad? con las necesidades bajo la ley. So, based on this history, it's clear for us that an additional level of transparency and uh, accountability will support the agencies to comply with the needs under the law. Y esto no reemplazará eh, las estructuras de cumplimiento, ¿verdad? Pero agrega un apoyo, un apoyo más a, a esta estructura. Confiamos en la Comisión en, en, de, la, de Derechos Humanos como la agencia independiente para poder jugar este papel. We want to say that we trust the HRC as the independent agency to play this role. 
Y bueno, por último, quiero decir que creo en los valores del Estado de Vermont y la Constitución de los Estados Unidos y estos pasos importantes para las comunidades, eh, para la comunidad migrante, eh, se muevan eh, hacia adelante y no, y no se retrasen. Lastly, I want to say that I believe in the values of Vermont and the USA Constitution for these steps that are really important for the community, for our migrant community, to move forward instead of backwards. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Can you clarify more clearly or from my memory the issue with the Department of Motor Vehicles that affected the naked person? Sí, eh, bueno, como la agencia del DMV ha proporcionado información, eh, en mi caso y en otros, en una campaña de las agencias de inmigración, eh, el ICE, para eh, deportar a líderes de la comunidad migrante aquí en el estado de Vermont. Entonces, ellos dieron información eh, básica y necesaria que hemos dado con toda la confianza a la agencia del estado. So the DMV has been collaborating, in my case and other cases, sharing information uh, that we gave them, trusting them, uh, in this campaign of ICE targeting leaders in the community in Vermont. And that was one of the things that I wanted to bring. I know she's not here right now, but if we could remind her to look at how DMV gets not caught up somehow in this, all of this, instead of looking at Vermont State Police, for example, who may be doing an exemplary job, DMV at the same time is not caught up in any of this, and yet they're... Well, they are under fair and impartial. Well, our, well, they're law enforcement agents, yeah. but not the DMV oh, that, that, that gave out yeah. the information. So as we're looking at providing identification for migrants so that they can do their job and, and work, we are allowing DMV to skirt the responsibility to follow the fair and impartial policing policies of other policies. So I, I think they need to be included somehow here. That's what I was just trying to get at. I realize the Department of Motor Vehicle Inspectors yes. law enforcement, but I, I meant the, the department itself. So if we're moving to having uh, offenders get IDs from the DMV, say would be true. Okay. Yes, Senator White. So I take some responsibility for that. A number of years ago, um, I was in the car and I was listening to the issue of migrant workers. And I live in Wyndham County. We have very few dairy farms. And I said, wouldn't it be a great idea if we could get driver's licenses for them? So I introduced the bill. And it kind of backfired, I guess. The, um, <coughs> so this doesn't really um, go to the broader issue of the fair and impartial policing policy because there are many people who aren't in the migrant community who are affected by it. But the I keep thinking that we need to make sure that you get some kind of, of um, work visas to actually so that you there isn't this issue. And I know Alice and Easton in the department agency of A was working on that. That we have to, we need to do this, but we also need to pursue, continue to pursue that because you shouldn't be living in a shelter. So that I, I just needed to say that that if there, there are other things that we need to do for the migrant community in Vermont outside of the fair and impartial policy. Uh, if, if I may, you're completely right. And I think one thing that we make important right now is that a lot of people don't leave the farms or don't have right. access to different things. And as uh, Enrique explained, 
I coordinate the helpline at Michael Justice, and I receive phone calls, and we've been working a lot with um, service providers for uh, any kind of trauma, sexual violence, violent violence on the workplace. People are really afraid to call the police because they hear that even if my partner is an abuser and, and I reach out to the police, then he's gonna end up deported because there's gonna be this collaboration. And with the driver's license, we do a lot of education about how to take care of the driver's licenses and how um, that helps really the community to be not only out of the shadows, but to be integrated. Yeah. Um, because we don't have family here, so we need our community to, to feel as a family. So I think it's really important to understand that without the HRC, and you say they can get public records, there's information that they can get, but nobody's doing this. And when we get the information from the agencies that are not complying with the FIP, it's us, the ones that are being um, uh, affected by this, that we have to go and seek for these things and come over and over again to you every time saying, like, this is not compliant, this is not compliant. We see it not only with uh, our own experiences, but because we have to go and search for it. So that's why we are supporting this amendment, because we need an agency that's really going to do the job. Um, I would not say a lot of that, but I'd say that there was a misuse of the information. Misuse of the information, yeah. 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 The no, 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 no. With, I, with the immigration. Are there other questions? Thank you very much for coming back. We'll continue to look at this. Thank you. Can I say that? Thank you. under 
what was believed to be the compliant policy that the state police had at the time. In early 2019, the VSP, working closely with the office, revised their policy and brought it into compliance with legislation. That information hadn't made it to the agencies that were using the VSP policy. When I spoke with those agencies, um, they immediately adopted the council policy. Right? There were a couple of agencies that were using the 2016 essential service uh, version, thinking it was compliant. I think it was compliant. Immediately adopted the council policy. One agency um, did exactly what Senator Way pointed out last week, did not include the entire policy because they had bits and pieces of, of the council policy covered in other sections. And in an effort to keep things simple, they would simply, knowing it was covered elsewhere, they simply excised it from the current policy. So we had a conversation about cross-referencing and there, were, there was a section in there that they didn't include because they didn't think it applied to them. So we had a conversation about that. That agency has since um, revised their policy and has submitted it to the Attorney General's office for final review. My first reading of it before I went to the AG's office was that I think the AG will find it in compliance. And as I sit here this morning, it is, I, I believe we have, but we'll have by the end of the day, 100% compliance among these agencies. Now, it's important to note a couple things. First, I have never ever received a complaint. This was self-initiated based on information that I received from attending the hearing last week. The second thing that I think is important is that none of these agencies have failed to adopt the policy. A couple were very outdated, a couple were current, but there's no agency that failed to adopt the policy. And the policies, even though outdated, for the most part, are still very robust policies. The, um, and were essentially either the earlier version of the VSP policy or the uh, earlier version of the council policy. But they all had a policy. The, um, there was one agency that had a change in leadership, and the leadership change wasn't aware of the requirement for the adoption of the policy. So when I brought that individual to speed, immediately adopted the council policy. So the, the, even though we had, we'll say 10 out of compliance, because three of those 13 weren't compliant, nobody didn't have a policy. And I would say the common thread that I saw that contacted agencies was that they were simply unaware of changes in policy. So when I would send out an email talking about compliance, about the new policy, if they had what they thought was a compliance state police policy, then they assumed they'd stay in compliance. So it was a little bit of an education process. So that, that piece of it is pretty effective. Agencies are very responsive. Um, let's talk about the enforcement mechanism a little bit. Most of you on the committee remember all the um, discussions and back and forth about professional regulation and law enforcement conduct that resulted in Act 56 of 2017, went into effect in July 1 last year. Act 56 dramatically expanded the uh, categories of misconduct that law enforcement officers could engage in and separated criminal conduct, gross professional misconduct, and offenses against counsel processes. Failure to abide by a state requirement was specifically added in that language to capture just such uh, events as this. Um, it was not intended to be used if an agency was simply mistaken. That's an education process. If an agency had refused to adopt one of these policies, then my response to that one been dramatically different than, than what it actually was. There's also a mechanism built into Act 56 that pretty clearly um, talk about the consequences 
consequences for misconduct. It can range anywhere from a verbal warning by the council up to and including permanent decertification. In other words, they can never apply for recertification regardless of how much time has passed. So it, Act 56 is a very robust act. Senator White said there was a neighbor in our testimony in that. <laughs> uh, it, it's a very robust act. We, um, agencies are mandated to report acts of misconduct to us. And they are required by law to conduct internal investigations if they receive complaints. So if an agency had received a complaint of misconduct referenced one of their officers, that agency had is required by law to conduct the investigation. And in fact, if failure to conduct the investigation becomes an actionable thing for the council. Um, for it, if I could just comment briefly, Rick. Uh, I would like to focus on the amendment in front of us as well. But I understand what you're saying. But I guess when I looked at your list of the 13 communities, and I'm going to pick on Ludlow because Senator Nick is not here and lives in Ludlow. Um, <laughs> the Ludlow Police Department was operating under a very old policy. I spoke to Chief Billings about the changes in the policy. He immediately adopted the council policy of verbatim. I mean, that's great, but evidently the Ludlow Police didn't see the model policy as a priority. And it took migrant justice mentioning it and then you calling the chief in order to get it there. You need a better means of communicating that this this is an important policy point. And I and I have sensed that you recognize the importance of these policies. You've been a leader in this. Sometimes you get uh, typecast as not, but you have been a leader. And it's unfortunate when police departments just, oh, okay, I didn't have, I have an old policy. I'll adopt a new one. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. And who knows what goes on tomorrow in Ludlow. So I, I guess that would be a comment. And going back to the amendment from the uh, Human Rights Commission, I think we would all agree that narrowing it would be uh, probably something we ought to do that is extremely broad at this point, as Senator Benning pointed out. But do you, do you have any comments on that particular proposal? Well, I, I think that uh, a, a kind of a double but that my that comment about right. red low and, and just in general, I'm curious of why they wouldn't. Thank well, it, it was impossible for me to determine whether it was a fact that the chief didn't get the information. I think that a, a mechanism where agencies had to submit the policies to the council along the rule. But, but they didn't see it as a priority. They did not. Actually, you covered mine. Oh, great minds think alike. Or a blind squirrel finds an acorn. <laughs> That's what we say in golf when we get a good shot. I just uh, we have we have eighty two agencies in the state, I believe. Sure. I think it's eighty two. Yeah. And um, so there are there are agencies that probably didn't give it um, like Ludlow that didn't seem to care. But thirteen out of eighty two is I mean, I'm just saying that that um, many of them have taken this very seriously. The majority of the 13 too, took it seriously. They, there was really confusion about their version being mine or not. But there were a couple that had to get into a specific proposal. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. From the Human Rights Commission. Yeah. Right. We, we would oppose that. That's, we share the concerns that that's extremely broad. We're also concerned that there's kind of a, a conflation of responsibilities. It's really a council responsibility to address these as they come in. Um, the enforcement mechanism actually exists within the council at this point through Act 56. Would you have suggestions on narrowing that? Uh, give me some time to work on it. I have some suggestions. Okay. We will obviously not finish our work on this bill today. 
Um, have there other questions for Rick? Rick, thank you for going through the, taking the time to go through these 13 agencies and sharing with us the responses, which I think, you know, are indicative of some confusion here. But, you know, there were many, as you said, who had already had it adopted and for some reason the communication wasn't there. So the next witness is David Scherr from the Department of the Attorney General's Office. Not a department yet. Okay. Should we put it under the administration? Well, there, there have been proposals over the years to know. Or maybe legislative action. 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 Anyway, it's still an independently elected official, so you are representing the Attorney General. That's right. Thank you very much. David Chair for the record. Um, the Attorney General does not oppose in concept something along the lines of what the Human Rights Commission has suggested here. At the same time, uh, it's the Attorney General's position that it is his top priority to pass H518 as it was passed by the House. And as we testified at length last week, H518 does a lot of, or a number of very important things that we think it is essential uh, to move forward. And if an amendment along these lines ends up um, potentially derailing the bill, it is the priority of the Attorney General to make sure that uh, H518 does get passed with, as it was passed by the House. With regard to some of the uh, enforcement investigation issues, um, the Attorney General's office does have a statutory role in, we are to act in consultation with the Criminal Justice Training Council to make sure that agencies are in compliance. That is an obligation that we take very seriously. We take it seriously because it is the law and we're obligated to follow the law. But just as importantly, we take it seriously because of the incredibly important policy concerns that underlie the fair and impartial policing policy and the immigration uh, aspects of that policy. Fair and impartial policing is incredibly important for the credibility uh, and trust of community members in Vermont, and the immigration piece uh, is essential to ensuring that everybody who is in Vermont trusts uh, the Vermont, Vermont police. And, and exactly, and one of the reasons that I appreciate our Attorney General being an independently elected official <coughs> that the Attorney General is not beholden to the executive branch. And I'm curious as to whether or not the Attorney General could have held the Department of Motor Vehicles liable for releasing the information on Enrique and other uh, people with similar status to us. Senator, that, I mean, that, you know, it just it bothers me that they were able to do that. And it wasn't the first time that's happened, by the way. So, Senator, at this moment, the Attorney General's Office is involved in litigation on that exact issue. Well, so, I shouldn't ask a question. Because <laughs> it's under that's right. I'm obligated not to make specific it's comments. Sort of like that. the reason that Donald Trump can't release his taxes. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not exactly the same. But the. Um, <laughs> I will say the Attorney General, speaking generally. I think, no, I'm really zeroing in here on that because we can do all we want fair and partial policing, get all the cooperation we want from law enforcement. Then there's this mistrust that legitimately comes from the government putting together a licensing proposal to allow people to lead as normal a life as possible as workers and members of the Vermont community and then having that information turned over to the immigration services. It just undercuts all the efforts that are being made and makes proposals like this seem more necessary. And, 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 and that, I'm not suggesting it isn't, but we've already talked about it being wrong, but I will say that that's part of the problem here is mistrust and open. Absolutely. And with I'm glad to hear that it's under litigation. Um, and the trust issue is the key issue here. And with uh, an HRC role or without an HRC role, uh, 
I do want to assure the committee and ensure everybody that the Attorney General takes very seriously ensuring that these policies are being implemented. Uh, assuming something like this passes, we will have a new July 1 deadline to ensure compliance. To the extent that we don't already have direct outreach with agencies, I have no doubt that Executive Director Gothier uh, and myself will be working to be absolutely sure that we have compliance on the part of each agency. I think the training issue that was brought up is also really important, uh, and Director Gothier has been working hard to implement training both on the sort of unbiased policing aspect as well as on the immigration policy aspect. And our office has been, is, will be working with state police to uh, do uh, additional trainings beyond what the statutory <coughs> required uh, with regard to heat incidents, fair and partial policing, um, and immigration policy issues, which have not been, are not up and running yet, but uh, will be held at barracks around the state in order to make it easy for local agencies to attend. Uh, and the director of our Civil Rights Division, Leo Thompson, will be assisting with those trainings. So all those pieces are incredibly important. It's stuff that we're working hard to advance, and I just want to assure the committee of our commitment to those issues, uh, in addition to other efforts that may come into play here. So I, I don't know that the AG has any role in this at all, but it seems to both of my kids who are adults work at um, resort areas, one in Montana and one here. And they have what they call the internationals that come every year to work in the ski industry. And for the most part, I mean, they're, they're here legally, so they don't have an issue around immigration. They Policy. They may have an issue around fair and impartial policing, but they don't have. So, is there? Does the AG have any role in trying to figure out a way of? We, I th think that the latest we heard we have something like 1,700 um, undocumented migrant workers in our. Um, they are mostly dairy industry. Why? Why is it so impossible to get some kind of work visas for the, the, there are they called H one fives or something that people get to come here because they're technology experts or work in the ski industry? Oh, I don't understand why that is so impossible to do. And that was before this current administration. So. Yes, and we agree that that's a serious concern. That is really a federal issue in terms of the visa problem, and it is outside of our purview. Certainly, we agree as a matter of policy that that should be accessible and would help in a myriad of ways. Right. Um, unfortunately, I, our office doesn't have the, any direct authority on that issue. Right, so Al, I think Allison Easton, I don't know that she was able to get any place, but I know that she was working with the ag agency to try to. There are, there are businesses, for example, in Bennington for years, there was a Japanese American partnership that makes steering columns, mostly steering columns on foreign cars that made in Bennington for one. So when you say I'm buying a foreign car and somebody criticizes you, you're actually buying a steering with a made in Bennington. But that's my little ad. Right? But they allow workers from Japan yeah. to come over for four years. They, you know, are become residents of the community. They're involved in the community, and they're all legally right. here. Why? You know, what I'm your question is: Why right. aren't others treated in a similar fashion that are doing work on our dairy farms, right. places, and our resorts? And that really is the federal. Failure of the federal immigration laws because they have that set up. Um, and I know in, in industries in the area where I came from in Massachusetts, there's actually agreements with other countries to send workers into those technical kind of a, a, a computer, not computer, but it's you know technical stuff that they do. And, and they come from other countries, they're allowed to work for a certain amount of time. Money, etc., etc. Et so it's just, it has been somewhat of confusion here that a particular, it seems like particular workers and from 
particular countries are more discriminating against than others. Yeah, and that's what we're stuck with because of the failure of Congress to pass and the president to pass Congress. I guess our dairy workers are less important than our well, power industry. Yeah, no, I'm just saying I mean, there's that, an unfairness the there right. because Correct. 
and that can create confusion sometimes within yeah, the community. I can see how that might affect All right. Other questions for the captain? Captain, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. And uh, I am. Uh, Bryn's come in and out. She's right there. Oh, hi, Bryn. Hi. Um, Bryn, I think you missed some of the testimony. Could you join us for about three minutes? Sure. Please. Um, I think the committee is looking at two things. One is how an agency of state government like the Department of Motor Vehicles, not the motor vehicle inspect the law enforcement arm, not that, but the agency itself is how it can share information with immigration. Um, and how it, it, that should have been clear that they, that they can't, um, or shouldn't have been. So we, we might want something in statute about that. And secondly, um, hopefully, after hearing the testimony, we can work with the Human Rights Commission, ACLU, Attorney General's Office, the Training Council, and others on revising the proposal from the Human Rights Commission to make clear that they wouldn't have access necessarily. One of the points that Senator Benny made, that he clearly made it clear that they would not have access to information as part of an investigation that is not allowed anyway to the public. But, uh, if they have some <coughs> following complaints. Um, so anyway, I'll, is that kind of? Well, yeah, but that's the very information that they would need to have at some point in time to establish any kind of well, information. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how, whether or not this is possible or whether we just put <coughs> something as stated, it's important to get this bill through this year. Um, and we can always put something in on the past to work on it as well in the interim. It's not the end of the I don't want to lose the bill. 